Hey everybody, it's me, the voice behind Break the Mold Studios Equine Art. Today I'm going to be showing you guys a little speed sculpt video. Um, I've been meaning to incorporate a little more of my process of sculpting in with my channel and my studio. And uh, so the other day I did about a three hour sculpting session on some pieces that I'm working on right now and I thought that I would uh, videotape and uh, speed them up for you guys so that I could do a little conversation about my process and uh, how I go about making these pieces because I think that that's a really interesting and important part of the hobby that doesn't always get as much uh, light shed on it as I think is important. So, um, I'm starting to work on a Mustang mare and foal here. I would have liked to have started at the beginning of my sculpture, but I didn't have the, the thought to do these videos before I started this piece. Um, so I'm kind of jumping in in the middle for you guys. Um, I've already created the basic anatomy of the horse at this point, and now I'm starting to work on the face, which is what I work on for the majority of the beginning part of this video. Um, working on the face is very important because the expression of your horse sets the tone for the entire sculpture, and I really like to focus a lot of time and energy on this area of the sculpture uh, to make sure that I get the exact expression that I'm looking for. Um, in this video, I also included all of my reference photos that I'm using on the left side because I think that that is a really important aspect of sculpture and, and any sort of art where you're working with anatomy and things like that because um, it's really easy to get lost in the weeds when you're working on something so dense and anatomical uh, like an equine. Um, because you, you start to draw in what you think you know is there instead of what you see. And it's really easy to uh, become cartoony or go off on the anatomy or have the wrong expression if you're not constantly paying attention to your reference photos. And I feel like a lot of people are scared to use reference photos because they think that that's quote-unquote cheating. Well, it's not, you know, you're not copying exactly what it is that you see uh, as far as everything about the horse pose and everything, you, the best way to do reference photos is to have an entire folder. Um, I probably have almost a hundred for this project and I just flip back and forth to try and find different photos at different angles that I can work with the anatomy on. Um, here you see I'm refining the face and one of the important things that I did um, earlier that I should have talked about while I was doing it, is the eyes on this piece. Um, they were coming out very aggressive looking, and for a moment I couldn't figure out why, and then I had to uh, tweak a little bit with the shape of the mare's eyes and the shape of the bone uh, that rests behind the eyes in order to give her that softer, more sweet eye look that, that Mustang mares have. And I'm paying very close attention to the breed that I am trying to portray here. I see a lot of Mustangs portrayed as just kind of a generic horse type, but they actually have, uh, depending on the region, very specific physical characteristics that set them apart from other breeds of horse. Um, for the mares specifically, I, I noticed that a lot of them have very angular jawlines, but very feminine looking faces. Um, their noses come to a, a point, their eyes are very kind and, and gentle shaped, and they have those large fluffy ears that, that set on both sides of their head that really set them apart from most other stock horses as well. So I'm trying to capture the exact look of, of what I see on the other side of the screen when I'm looking at these horses. Um, just trying to make them as similar as possible. Um, another thing that I like to do with my reference photos is find multiple photos of the same horse. You see here I just flipped through three different photos from three different angles of this same mare. Um, and I, uh, I got these all off Instagram and that's a great 
resource and a great place to find reference photos um, because when you just search on Google Mustang mare or whatnot you're gonna find a lot of different photos of a lot of different horses and sometimes those different horses are going to have different anatomical features and if you're looking at them from different directions um, then then you may be trying to add conflicting pieces of anatomy on this horse because you're using two different horses as a reference. Of course, I do use different horses on this project, but for the face, I tried to create a very specific look, um, which is what I'm messing with here. It's, it's a lot of tiny tugging and pulling and readjusting things because even the tiniest little bit of off anatomy can cause a huge difference in the expression and the perception of the breed of the horse. Um, and, uh, so I'm, I'm paying really close attention to little angles and things on here. And I'm, uh, I'm using the newest version of Blender for this project. I just use my desktop and a mouse for this. Uh, nothing too fancy. Blender is free. Uh, I think that if you are passionate about something and have an artistic direction, you can have the ability to make great things out of resources that aren't necessarily especially expensive. Uh, my uh, advice to most artists is uh, just start with what you have, you know. Don't start with the most expensive tool out there or anything like that. Um, learn how to work with the basics and then incorporate those more expensive attributes in um, once you feel that you have the basics down. And right now I'm doing a lot of readjusting on the nose and the mouth of the piece. Um, see how the lips kind of protruded before? They were kind of um, clown <laughs> lippy a little bit. And I uh, went through and I smoothed the areas around the nips, uh, <laughs> the lips into the sides of the face. And uh, I do a lot of jumping around when I'm messing with this. Um, I was working on the face and then saw something on the reference photo on the left that gave me an idea of something that needed to be added onto the horse, a detail. I don't go into too much body detail on this particular horse in this video, but this is something that I jump around and do a lot while I'm working, is if I see something very tiny in the reference photo that will add more realism to my piece, I add it in quickly before I forget it. Um, See, now her face is sort of getting to the point where it looks more like the breed that I was talking about. When I was starting out, uh, she looked kind of awkward, and now she looks more matronly, more merry, more horsey in general. And um, I just go through and adjust and adjust and adjust until I see the spaces that I'm not seeing correctly. Because you will be working through these and go like, ah, this doesn't look right. Um, but you won't know why it doesn't look right until you start messing with it. And uh, I spend a lot of time with the musculature and bone structure underneath the face on uh, pieces like this. You see I've added a very strong nasal bone to her because I see that in the photos that I'm looking at. And it helps to have kind of a dry musculature in these pieces. I don't know if that makes sense, but, but you know, something that sticks to the bones, something that you can see the muscles underneath. You want to be really aware of how what you're sculpting is a layer of skin over a very specific anatomical structure underneath, and you need to pay attention to those things. Um, just the most important thing is always to pay attention to your references and um, sculpt what you see, not what you think you know. Because your brain will forget things, and pictures don't lie. <laughs> Unless they're photoshopped, but that's not the case in these instances. Um, readjusting the sides of her head, and it, it's very important to work on these pieces from all angles, uh, because very, very often you will create a piece that looks absolutely wonderful and correct on one side uh, from the profile view, uh, but then looks horrible <laughs> when you look at it from the front. Um, so it's important to keep rotating and adjusting at different angles while you're working on something. 
And here you're going to see me make a little bit of a mistake that I was talking about. Um, I start working on the neck in a moment, and, and what I do in the neck is uh, just sculpt what I know to be a stock horse type chest or neck with you know strong musculature and uh, a heavy muscle at the ba uh, base between the head and the ears and um, that's actually incorrect for the mustang mares that i'm working on um, i check some other reference photos later and realize that it's not supposed to look like the same as like a say a quarter horse mare uh, mustang mares actually have a lot less muscle in their necks they're a lot thinner and a lot more uh u-shaped and and soft and um that i i i fix later after looking at some reference photos and realizing i had done it incorrectly and i think that that's an important process to see too because you really see the difference in how it makes this horse believable as a Mustang. And I do a lot of this while I'm working, um, masking off areas and then making them uh, smaller or larger based on what I see. Uh, I tend to over sculpt the size of the head, so I have to adjust that. Um, <laughs> I probably do this a lot harder ways than most people. Uh, I didn't come at this sculpting with a digital background. I came at it with a sculpting background, so I'm used to working with clay. So I treat my horses like clay when I'm working them in these programs and not like meshes like you probably should. Um, so I kind of make it all out of one piece and adjust those pieces at uh, different portions of the sculpting process. Um, I know some people probably noticed that I didn't make separate mesh circular eyeballs for this horse. And, um, you know, I probably should, and I probably could, but this is just how I'm used to doing it at this point. And um, I have not had any particular problems with it, so I just continue to do it because it's what I'm used to. Um, so uh, once again, your sculpting process doesn't have to be my sculpting process. You may find something that works so much better for you if that's what you want to do. Um, but this is what works for me, so that's what I'm showing. Um, a lot of times I'll be working on something like this and get into the little detail areas like the top of the nose there, and you'll see that the mesh starts to look kind of sharp. Um, that's when I would remesh things um, because when you're working on tiny spots like that and you're inflating or pulling them um, it can create kind of uneven areas where where the mesh has been pulled too much and, and needs to be adjusted and that's something that doesn't happen when you're sculpting by hand and so that was something that I really had to get used to when I was sculpting like this was having a point after which detail would be difficult to add if I didn't make things larger um, or, or more resolute. Um, but I'm adding in little details like the lip wrinkles here, and I'll probably go back in and change those again. Um, but one thing that I do a lot is when, when I'm sculpting like this, my kind of modus operandi is to add things in harder or, or deeper or, you know, more blown up than I need, and then smoothing it down with the smooth tool. And I think that's something that's, I don't know, a little bit more my style, um, what I like to do with these sculptures. I've had people tell me that my sculptures look too smooth, quote unquote, and, uh, but I, I don't know, this is what I like to do. <laughs> and here I noticed that the muzzle was kind of facing at an odd angle. I was looking at my reference photos and realized that the planes on the face didn't line up correctly if the muzzle was facing that direction, so I just did a little bit of an adjustment and then smoothed out those spots where I had caused a wrinkle in the sculpture. Here I'm starting to fix the neck, starting to add that little hollow in the center uh, and remove that large muscle that I had created on the uh, top of the neck adding a little bit of the u-shape of the neck because mustang mares tend to have that kind of weak neck um, which i find interesting since they live in the wild um, mustangs are really interesting 
to sculpt and and to observe as someone who knows you know a lot about confirmation of horses it's interesting what nature uh provides these animals uh because you know it is survival of the fittest so the the genetics that survive and uh get to create more foals in a new generation are the ones that were to some degree better adapted to uh the lifestyle that they have to live on the range and i think it's really interesting to see what that creates and here i'm noticing again uh, another little difference that wasn't making this look like a mustang uh her neck was too long mustang mares tend to have kind of shorter stockier necks and um I realized that while looking at my references, and that's why the references are so important, because you think you know what you know, but you don't always know what you know, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so I do a lot of levels of uh, sculpting in detail and then uh, kind of smoothing it out and then sculpting in even more detail on top of that. I try to get a lot of the skin texture present in these horses when I work on them later and I hope to have another video that really explores that but right now you can see even as I'm working in this I, I haven't posed her in the pose that I want to have her in permanently uh, but I am adding some things like wrinkles on the mouth the nose the eyes the the armpits uh, areas that are going to have those regardless of how I turn her and um, this is another reason why I skip around when I'm working on these reference photos. I opened this up to have a reference for the mare's neck and then looked down and noticed that there was a decent reference for her legs as well. So I added in a little detail while I was working on that. And here you see me looking at the foal right there and getting ideas. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna import a Costello in here. Costello is one of my previous sculptures, my first sculpture that was produced actually. Um, and he is a foal, but he is a Frisian foal. Um, but I remembered uh, that you know he has a, a similar anatomy and size to these little Mustang foals. So what I'm going to do is import him and make a baby for the mama that I'm working on. Um, I like to use previous meshes that I had sculpted uh, occasionally in order to uh, still have that correct anatomy and, and things down and not have to start over from scratch. Um, but I never keep elements of the horse in there that could be recognizable. Um, you'll watch I, I reposition him and then smooth him down almost completely so that I can uh, re-detail over top of him. Um, to create the fold that I'm looking to do, and, and it will be unrecognizable as him when I'm finished. Um, of course, I only ever do this with my own meshes. I don't do this with anybody else's. That's not ethical, and that's not okay, especially if you're selling things. It's a little bit different if you're just doing them for yourself, but um, because I sell these to the public, I, I wouldn't ever want to steal from someone or, or worry about copyright infringement, um, you can get sued for shit like that. So uh, just be mindful. And you see I am repositioning his head and neck here. I'm trying to figure out the best way to do it. Um, like I said, I kind of do this the hard way. Most people just make the different aspects out of different meshes and sculpt them separately and then add them back together when they're finished. I have not really figured out how to do that in a way that I feel works for me. So I'm once again doing this the hard way. You can see me try to troubleshoot a little bit of a problem here where his head isn't coming out correctly because I have left X mirroring on and should have just taken X mirroring off. <laughs> um, but I eventually get it figured out as you'll see. I like to leave X mirroring on when I am working on the original parts of the horse. I, I kind of have 
a loose structure to how I work on pieces like this. I generally start out with the basic anatomy of the horse with the X mirroring on, look at my reference photos of a horse standing, uh, and, and get those anatomy points down correctly, the muscles, the bones, the, the distance of the back, the distance of the legs, things like that. Um, basic musculature, and then I work on the face a little bit, and then after I have the details down on the legs, the face, the neck, the body, that's when I start to reposition the horse. Although I do break that a little bit with Costello here, because as I was working on him, I didn't want him to look like Costello. I wanted it to start to look like this Mustang filly that I'm working on. Um, to break it up, I decided to reposition him before I finished detailing him so that I could see the differences and, and really try to push him in a different direction that didn't look like the original Costello. And you can already see um, the sort of resemblance that I'm constructing between the full on the left and my sculpture. Um, I noticed that they have much more long, boxy faces when, when foals are first born. Their jaws are almost the same width as their muzzle. and. Uh, they create a really rectangular head that I hadn't been paying attention to when I sculpted Costello. Um, so now I really pay attention to that when I'm repositioning him here uh, to be the Mustang filly. And I just love <laughs> sculpting the baby next to the mama like this. They look so cute together and I don't know, I'm just, I'm just a sap, sap for that. I haven't really decided whether I want the mom to be very pregnant here or after just having a full um but i'll go about deciding that later i suppose so here i'm really trying to pay attention to the shape of the neck the angle of the head things like that so that what i'm creating is no longer what he was before getting that anatomically correct for the specific breed that she's going to be is really important to the process. I'm pushing a little more of that shape of the head, the, the rectangular shape, and then I'm adding in uh, the, the very thin very full like neck and shoulders and legs. I noticed that this foal is a lot more spindly than I made the original sculpture here. So I'm going to add a little bit of a different shape to the legs, a little bit of a different shape to the waistline, knobbier knees, um, and longer pasterns on this foal. A lot of times when foals are born, they look a little over at the knee and a little long and angled in the pasterns because they were folded up inside their mama. Um, in a very tight way to, to obviously fit in there. So they have these like gangly looking attributes that I didn't pay attention as much to in the original sculpture, um, but definitely try to pay attention to this time when I'm redoing things. Again, I have multiple photos of the same foal to reference. Um, I think that's really helpful to me in this because I'm getting the correct anatomy no matter which angle I'm looking at. Um, just remove the tail here. And then I notice that the, uh, the hips are a lot more angled and sharp um, than I originally made them, so I'm going to adjust that as well. And already now it kind of looks like a different foal standing there. Just a little bit of more pull and tug adjustment. And um, after this video, if you guys would like to comment anything that you'd like to see specifically or anything that you'd like to talk, uh, like me to talk about during this process, uh, that would be super helpful. Um, I'd love to know what it is y'all are interested in seeing 
with my sculpting process, um, anything you're interested in seeing me sculpt, because that's also a wonderful factor and helpful for me to understand what everybody's interested in seeing. Um, I'd like to do more of these videos, obviously. I had recorded all the audio for this video yesterday and then realized that my audio recorder wasn't working. So if I sound a little <laughs> not as enthusiastic this time around, it's because I've done this twice now and I'm trying to remember what I talked about originally, which isn't the best. Um, but here you can see I'm making a little more definition in the shoulders and the chest area and the neck of this horse because the foal on the left, the little Mustang foal, has a lot of definition. It uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, meat on his bones to say. <laughs> um, so I'm really trying to capture that. Um, the foal is probably about one day old in these photos. So the the fulliness, <laughs> if you can say that, is, is very defined. Um, and, and you really have to pay attention to the ways that they're different than adult horses because when you're sculpting a foal, you're not just sculpting a small horse. Um, they, they have very different anatomical structures. Uh, and that's why I really like portraying them. You, you have to be very concerned with the differences and, and making the foal look gangly enough and, um, Understanding the breed too. It's a lot easier to analyze the breed of an adult horse than than a young horse And you really have to be specific and deliberate about it with, so that the breed comes through Here I'm noticing that the the legs on the foal are quite dry. So I'm adding some definition to these legs um, They no longer have the same details that Costello's legs had so that's another reason to smooth things down and add them in again um, so that you don't replicate your own work. And here I, uh, I mentioned I'm breaking my, my cycle of work a little bit to add uh, the movement into this full. Uh, and I'm paying attention to the knobby knee and the long pasterns and the angle. The angles are very important when you're looking at uh, things like this. Another thing that you want to think about when you're moving legs and body parts to readjust is that you should not be bending any area where a horse in real life would not bend. Um, so as you can see, when I'm readjusting these legs, I readjust them at the joints. It's very important to maintain that bone structure because if you try to bend in the middle of the leg where there would be a straight bone and no joint, you're going to look like your horse is just dying. <laughs> Got a broken leg, needs to be taken out to pasture. And I try to think a lot about how the horse will stand with this movement as well. As you can see, this piece is on three legs and uh, would probably tip a little bit to that back hoof. So when I finish this out, I either plan on adding a tiny peg to that back hoof or lowering it slightly a little out of the, the look of the reference so that he stands on uh, four feet. That's another thing I think a lot of people don't think about when they're... These, these specific pieces are... Um, I have a plan to make micros out of. I think a lot of people when they're sculpting these, especially the micros, don't think about the weight distribution and end up creating micros that are incessantly tippy <laughs> and just fall over on your shelf every five seconds. And uh, I am not immune to that, but um, my last few sculptures I've made a lot of... Um, adjustments in order to cater to that, in order to cater to them as physical objects uh, so that they can stand and, and, and be viewed in a safe way. I don't really want to have to replace a bunch of broken pieces for people. <laughs> Now I'm almost to the end of uh, my, it was about a three hour sculpting session that I worked on these guys so you can understand the amount of uh, time and, and work that are put into these. Um, right now I'm just fixing little objects and adding them in. I may uh, go back and record 
more sessions with these two pieces if you guys are interested in that. Um, probably have better things to say next time since I'm not very tired <laughs> and uh, had already recorded this and had it deleted. Um, but if you have anything specific that you'd like to see, any questions that you have that I haven't answered, uh, please feel free to comment them. Um, if you'd like to see more of this, uh, then please subscribe or follow me on Instagram at breakthemold underscore studios. Uh, that's where you can find all my work. I'm also on Facebook at Break the Mold Studios. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed watching this, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, come back for more. Thank you so much.